Moving right along, I'm really excited about tonight's topic. Um, it's a great topic to talk about because beef ribs can be challenging for a lot of people, including myself, before I figured them out. My daughter Delaney is dancing up a storm behind the counter right now, trying to make me laugh. But I am unlaughable. That's so not true. Yes, you it just is. did. You just I smile. I'm a happy guy. You internally chuckled. So, brief overview of what we're doing tonight, guys. I am cooking two different cuts of beef ribs. We have beef back ribs, we have beef short ribs. They're both delicious. Some people prefer one or the other. Some of them are more common than others. And I'll talk a little bit about my approach to how to cook this stuff. We are going to talk seasoning, cooking, low and slow, hot and fast. Most importantly, we'll be talking about tenderness. And that's it. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the laziest grand champion cook out there. I have eliminated so many complications from my cooking process over the years. The beef ribs we're doing tonight are just about as simple as it gets. And they're the beef ribs I enjoy the most. So let's get right into it. Beef ribs are challenging. Um, they don't have to be. What makes them a little bit challenging for some people is that they are a really, really tough cut of beef. Probably tougher than brisket. I've never eaten them raw to compare. And they contain a lot of collagen. Anybody not familiar with collagen, that's the web of white marbling you see running through something like a brisket point muscle. It's running through these beef ribs like crazy. Let me see if you can zoom in here. Get the right angle on the camera. All these white streaks you see running through there, yeah, there's fat in there, but most of that is that collagen we're talking about. We need that collagen to break down as that happens, that collagen converts into gelatin. And that's what provides this meat with the vast majority of its moisture, flavor, and spectacular mouthfeel. We're going to get it right into it here. Um, the solution to the challenge with beef ribs is just to give them more time. That resolves the challenge every single time. So, moving right along here, I'm going to talk a little bit about two different cuts that are on the cutting board here. Number one, we have beef back ribs. These are a little more common in places like grocery stores. Beef back ribs um, are really delicious, but there's a couple things to watch out when you're shopping. Secondly, we have beef short ribs. This is a full rack here, four bones. Sometimes you'll find them with three bones. We'll come back to that a little bit in a little bit. But let's get right into the cooking process here. So these, if you watched my presentation last week, we talked about cooking prime rib. This is the full rack of beef ribs that we trimmed off the prime rib last week. So we're going to get in here now. And the nice thing about trimming the beef ribs ourselves is that we were able to retain most of the meat on the top side of those bones. If you're buying beef ribs in most grocery stores, what you'll find, see it a little, see it a little bit right here. You see the edge there. In the grocery stores, you'll find a lot of that meat's been carved out in between the bones. Again, that's because these are the this is the meat that's attached to the, the prime rib. If they can leave all that meat attached to the boneless prime rib, it's going to be worth a lot more once it hits the scale and once the consumer pays for it. If you have a butcher that you know and trust, uh, we use Butcher Boy Meats in Regina. They may be able to carve this off the prime rib for you, so you end up with a rack that's got a lot more meat on it. Or... If you uh, end up watching the video we did last week, we'll trim that out ourselves, and that's fairly easy to do if you buy a bone-in prime rib. So that's the back rib overview. Uh, may as well talk about how we're going to season this thing, get it on the smoker. I do flip my meat around a lot in case anybody <laughs> hasn't noticed that already. We go pretty straightforward on the beef ribs here, guys. You could get crazy with injections and things like that. Um, I just want to put a dry rub on here and I'll show you what we did today. Basic mustard binder here. Doesn't have to be mustard. You could use any other flavor that complements beef. Uh, steak sauce is one I used to use on brisket quite a lot. You'll notice I'm not trimming any membrane off the back here and, and uh, you'll see why in a little bit when I pull that cooked rack out of the cooler. Uh, I fully believe that that membrane you could pull it off if you want, but by the time these are done cooking and all that collagen is broken down, 
that membrane really does help tie these ribs together. So on the back ribs today, we went with a little more of a sweet and saucy flavor profile. So we're gonna get in here with our spice rub. This is our tumbleweed all-purpose rub. And it was designed to work as well on chicken and pork as it does on beef. So good, well-rounded rub. We're gonna put a pretty heavy application of spice rub on here. Okay, I'm just letting that rub fall down from about six or eight inches above the rack. I don't necessarily want to physically rub that seasoning in. I think as long as you have a moist surface on the meat, it, it adheres pretty well. You may come in here and pat it down. I like to apply this spice rub anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes before the ribs go on the smoker. That gives enough time for the chemical reaction to occur that we're looking for. The salt content in this rub will start to draw some moisture up out of that meat. As it does that, the salt in the rub will dissolve, the sugar will dissolve, and you'll end up with more of a wet paste on top of the surface of the meat. And that's what I'm looking for when I throw that meat on the smoker. That wet surface will help draw in smoke flavor. It'll also enhance the development of what's called a smoke ring. Uh, those of you experienced cooks know what a smoke ring is. There's no flavor to it, but it looks damn cool, so why not try to enhance it? We'll come back to cooking on that topic here shortly. Let's turn our attention to this bigger slab of ribs here. So these are known by a few different terms. Uh, commonly in Canada, they're known as short ribs. I'm going to change my gloves so we don't get any crazy cross rub contamination here. These beef short ribs, sometimes they're a little tricky to find in the full rack like this. This rack has four bones to it. It comes from the chuck primal of the animal. Sometimes you'll find short ribs that come three bones to a rack. Those are more frequently coming from the plate primal. So when they split up an animal, beef, I guess, when they split up a, a beef carcass, the major sections of that carcass get pro broken into what's known as primals. So this whole section of ribs you actually gets split into three different uh, primals. The loin primal will produce this back rib here. And the short rib, this is equivalent to the side ribs on a hog. It actually gets split right down the middle, even before those full racks are cut off the carcass. So half of that rack ends up as the plate primal, the other half ends up as the truck, chuck primal here. Either one will work. If you find a butcher that carries either one of these, you're in golden zone here, you're laughing. That's good to have. My first taste of really, really terrific beef short ribs came in Murfreesboro, Illinois. Murfreesboro, Illinois was a class I took about five years ago, known as the Whole Hog Extravaganza. Five or six uh, top whole hog cooks from around the United States convened in the small town of Murfreesboro. And there are some beef topics there too. So the beef rib discussion that weekend was taught by none other than Wayne Mueller of Louis Mueller Barbecue in Taylor, Texas. Wayne's a couple years older than I am. First time I ever met him. First time I ever tasted his food. Wayne cooked his beef ribs. He uses the chuck rib, just like we're using here tonight. He cooked it fairly hot, 325 to 350. Total cook time of five to six hours. He wrapped them in butcher paper and he let them rest for several hours before we got to eat them. And to that day, that was the single greatest bite of beef I had ever had in my life. I remember it to this day, it was one of those groundbreaking barbecue discoveries that changes everything for you. So I immediately came home and tried to start cooking it. To this day, I have not replicated that flavor and texture I got from those beef ribs, although I did make it back there to try it in the restaurant a couple years later. So I actually tracked Wayne down that evening and gave him a big old hug and probably sur <laughs> surprised the crap out of him. <laughs> but I had to share my appreciation for that bite of beef that I had. So. Let's move right along here. Depending on how your beef is processed, you'll often find this silver skin left on the top of the rack there, okay? We're gonna trim some of that off. I don't really want that to be part of the final eating experience. I'm just gonna be a little bit cautious here. I don't wanna to cut too deep, but that silver skin most likely is not gonna render down and end up as tender as we want. So we'll trim that off now. Sometimes you'll have a fat cap on here, sometimes you won't. But that thin silver membrane there is something I want to trim off. So we'll do that. And as I'm doing that, it does expose some of that fine collagen marbling in the meat underneath it. I'm pretty happy to see that. Get in here a little bit further, trim a little more of that silver skin back. 
and away we go. We're going to go with a little more of a classic Texas approach for this cut. Louis Mueller's barbecue, he's never kept the spice drum secret, is nine parts coarse black pepper to one part, did I say coarse black pepper? Yes, yes. <laughs> nine did. parts black pepper to one part kosher salt. Nine parts pepper, people. You'd think that this heavy application of rub would blow your mind. But by the time you're done eating it, the pepper does not overwhelm you at all. So I've had success anywhere from three parts pepper to one part salt, even up to five parts pepper. Uh, I haven't done the nine to one ratio myself. I don't think I have the confidence to fully pull it off, but three to one, four to one, those combinations work pretty well. We're gonna modify that a little bit here today. My approach with the beef ribs today was to do exactly what we're what doing right now here. So again, thin little layer of yellow mustard, some sort of binder on there. Uh, that's not necessary, that binder, but it does help us develop that spice rub that we're looking for here, that bark that really defines this Texas style beef rib. Uh, of course, we gotta get in here with the product. Prairie Steak Shake, did a fairly heavy application there. I'm gonna make sure I cover the edges here of the beef rack. Don't wanna miss those. Press it down with your meat hand. Try to get that spice rub to stick to adhere. I'm a kind of a stickler for sanitation here, guys. I use one hand with a glove on it for handling raw meat. The other hand stays clean. That's for handling my knife, knife handles, my spice rub, and so on. So that's a personal habit I've developed over the years. Carrying on, we'll get that spice rub on the top side of that beef rack. Again, nice even application of spice rub here. And beef ribs we're eating today, I went in with another layer of cracked black pepper. Unfortunately, I used up all the pepper I had in the house today. So I can't show you live on camera. If you're looking for a coarse ground pepper, uh, if you have a pepper mill at home, you can get in there and keep cranking. You want that the, the cracked pepper, the coarse grind pepper. That's going to help form that bark that this cut is famous for. And again, I would go with a fairly substantial layer of that pepper over top here. We've got about 100% coverage on the steak rub right now, and I'd go for another 50% layer of that pepper afterwards. So, Okay, I mean, that's, that's it for preparation, guys. You could get crazy and, and throw an injection in here if you like. Uh, like I said... I like simple as best. These ribs should taste amazing without any further interventions like that. So we're going to put these away. I'm going to ask the Delini to grab a plastic bag for me. Oh, we will cook these up another day. And I'm going to move on to talking about how we're going to cook these ribs. Remember guys, we are fishing for questions. Feel free to type it in the comments. And we'll come to those questions toward the end of the presentation here tonight. Um, cardboard box on one of the shelves. Okay. So trimming again, if you see any excess fat there, if you see any silver skin, feel free to trim that off. Uh, spice rub we covered. Let's talk about the cook a little bit here today. The ribs I cooked today were done with more of a low and slow approach, 250 Fahrenheit. The amount of time it takes is pretty hard to predict. It depends on the thickness of the ribs. It depends on, um, you know, the cow that the ribs came off of. We had two rack of ribs the same weight here. Chances are pretty good they both, wouldn't both finish at the exact same time. But here's my approach to cooking these two different when we're talking low and slow. Back ribs, I tend to approach more like pork ribs. Right, that rack of back ribs is sort of the beef equivalent of the baby back rib off the, off the hog. Beef ribs, I cook with the same process, probably cook for three, four hours. Wrap it up in foil, throw a little liquid in there. Today what we did was a little bit of beef broth in with that uh, wrapping process. If you look back in my stories from today, we put that wrapping process on video. So you can check that out after we're done the presentation here tonight. And I would count on a couple hours cooking in foil. Again, we're coming back to the fact that these beef ribs contain a lot of that connective tissue or collagen. We want to make sure that, that those ribs have enough time to fully tenderize. And that foil helps with that process quite substantially. Finishing off the beef ribs here today, um, how I know when they're done is based on how they feel. I'll show you that shortly when we pull the cooked ribs out of the cooler. I didn't use 
a thermometer at all today. Uh, it is of some limited value when you're first learning to cook because that thermometer kind of gives you some indication of how the, the cook is progressing. The actual finishing temperature is going to be north of 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's true for both of these cuts. It could be, could be 200, it could be 208, up to 210 sometimes. When we pull the cooked meat out, I'll show you exactly how I determine when that tenderness target is hit. So, that's it for the back ribs. Again, rough translation of our cooking process here is start with your process for pork ribs, add two to three hours. That's really it, guys. I wish it was more complicated so I could justify my time here tonight. The key is getting them tender, and we're, we're going to come back to that shortly. Moving on to the short ribs here. This is a pretty substantial rack. Short ribs, I treat more like a small brisket. If you're cooking a whole brisket, you're already counting on a cook time of 12 to 14 hours. Smaller brisket in the 9 to 10 pound range, you're going to cut that off at around 9 to 10 hours. So this full rack of beef short ribs is going to fall in that ballpark somewhere. I'll show you what we're looking for in regards to tenderness when we get there. Um, those short ribs, again, contain a lot more collagen. So we just want to make sure we give that enough time for that collagen to break down. Let's talk a little bit, oh, back to the short ribs. Uh, we did the full Texas style short rib wrap today. Uh, trusty butcher paper is what we use to wrap up those short ribs, or those chuck ribs today. If you're gonna use the butcher paper approach, it's really important that you have a paper that is not unlined, that is not lined. You don't have that plastic lining on the inside. That paper is often uh, referred to more frequently as freezer paper. That's what it's designed for. Uh, this unlined butcher paper is, is all the rage in barbecue circles right now. I'm not 100% on board with it. Um, it has function, it has purpose. The reason I have a little bit of a beef with it, is there's a lot of beginner cooks out there that assume they have to have butcher paper in their arsenal in order to cook a good brisket or a good wrap of beef ribs. And that is definitely not the case. The thousands or millions of great briskets cooked in North America in the last 10 or 20 years that didn't involve butcher paper at all. So um, I'm not going to call it a fad. It has its place. It has its purpose, but certainly not a requirement to cook any of this stuff. So the reason we use butcher paper today, which is the reason you would use butcher paper any day, that butcher paper allows that meat to breathe. It allows some moisture to escape out of the package. The reason that's beneficial is it helps us preserve the bark, that nice peppery bark that we spent so long forming. Uh, wrapping up in foil would actually soften that bark. Um, butcher paper allows some of that moisture to escape so that bark maintains some of its integrity. All right, that's it for my notes. Um, the period at which we wrap these ribs is not based on any sort of internal temperature. It's not based on a timeline. It's based on the bark development. I tried to take some really good photos this afternoon of the period at which I wrapped these uh, cuts of meat. So you can look back on those photos in our Instagram stories. Uh, not quite yet. It might be okay the way it is. Thank you. Uh, we, I wrap based on color. I wrap when that bark is really well developed, but I wrap before the meat gets too black or too dark. Uh, if you wrap too soon, there's a couple of issues. Number one, you could lose the texture of that bark that's already formed. Second issue is that the longer you cook meat wrapped up in foil, the greater risk you have of losing a lot of flavor in that meat, right? At the extreme end, cook a brisket for three hours on a smoker and wrap it up and cook it for another nine hours in the foil. You may taste a little smoke, but you're gonna taste a little more pot roast than anything. And you will have some flavor degradation the more time that meat spends wrapped up in the foil. So I like to foil or wrap meat later in the cooking process. That's something I've proven to myself over and over again with side-by-side -side trials. I'll take that to my grave, or at least somebody shows me a better, uh, more intelligent result. I change my opinions on barbecue every year, and this may be one of those topics. So, let me talk quickly about cooking hot and fast. Um, the smoker I use most frequently for cooking hot and fast is that Gateway Drum Smoker. Um, these beef ribs shine cooking hot and fast. The whole process ends up being quite a lot quicker. Hot and fast on my drum is 300 Fahrenheit to 325 Fahrenheit. Um, those back ribs, you know, again, compare them to pork ribs. Pork ribs cooking hot and fast, you're looking at two hours to two and a half hours. The beef ribs, it's a little bit longer, guys. Three hours, three and a half hours. They need a little more time, but they're bigger. There's more collagen to break down. Um, the short ribs, same thing. 
cooking a small brisket hot and fast, I'd be looking at about four hours total cook time. Um, these short ribs, even a thick rack like we had tonight, we'd be looking at four hours, maybe up to five. Um, again, I want, I want to make sure that we give enough time for that collagen to fully break down. The hot and fast, hot and fast method does require wrapping at some point through the cooking process. Because such it's, a, it's such a hot cooking environment, there is some risk of your meat burning if it's left unattended. Uh, wrapping up that meat, adding a little bit of liquid does help you accelerate the cooking process without burning the meat. So that's the hot and fast on a gateway drum. Uh, if you want to do hot and fast on a pellet smoker, you certainly can. Um, there's, a, there's a higher likely could, likelihood you won't have much smoke flavor in there, but it's certainly worth a shot. So we're ready to look at our cooked ribs, Delaney. What do you think of that? I think that's wow, that's such a great idea. Such a great idea. Amaze balls. They are in the cooler. Oh, don't let me say that. No, no amaze balls. Okay. Okay. Cooler right in front of you has mm -hmm. my towel. Oh, hey. Yeah. Right? Let's roll out a little paper here. Keep our mess ah, contained. Sorry about the noise. Let me grab a cutting board. Ah. Okay. Well, you're raw meat. Okay. Meat to lunch. Great. Oh, thank you. Ah, ha, ha. All right, meat wrapped up in foil, safely stowed in a hot towel. That's fine. Let's get in here, see what we've got. Hopefully this meat's cooled down a little bit. It actually came off the smoker about an hour ago. So it's been resting nicely. My cooking process today was, uh, you know, I, I took the temperature up and down a little bit on my Yoder pellet grill today, but it averaged 250. Give you a little sense of the timeline today. My short rib went on the smoker at eight o'clock AM, 250 degrees all day on average. They finished up at six o'clock PM, uh, maybe about 6.15. So that's a cold, total cook time of a little over 10 hours. The back ribs went on three hours later, so that makes 11 a.m. and they finished around 6 p.m. too. So it was about a seven hour cook period on the back ribs today. So let me get the ribs out here. We're gonna start with the back ribs. And I'm gonna show you what I'm looking for when I pull those ribs out of the foil and I'm trying to determine if they've gotten tender or not. This particular rack, Get more of a sweet and savory profile today. I did brush this with a little blue ribbon sweet sauce when they came off the grill. So you're gonna see some of that sauce in the foil here. So here's what I'm looking at. They're quite tender, so I'm being cautious here. I'm gonna zoom in there, please. Okay, we're just pretending those ribs are sitting on the smoker. I'm gonna reach in there with a pair of tongs or a, or a gloved hand. These nitrile dipped gloves are amazing for this sort of thing. You can find those at Princess Auto in Canada. I'll just reach in and grab that rack and just be very careful with it. You can see this one's already starting to split in half on me here. If you pick up that rack and it looks like it's ready to fall apart, that's all we're looking for here, guys. If you don't want to pick it up, you can move in with a probe. Pull our lava tools out here. And I'll just start probing that meat in between the bones. And all I'm looking for is how that probe feels when it's sliding in. I don't want to feel any resistance here. If you're curious now, that meat's been resting for a little over an hour. It's still temping at about 136, 155 Fahrenheit. Okay, so it's definitely cooled down a little bit. But that's it, guys. May as well carve these up. Have a little bite. Like I said, I do like to leave that membrane on the ribs just for that reason. The membrane's the only thing kind of holding these bones together at this point. If we were doing beef ribs for a competition, I imagine the texture criteria might be passed already. These are certainly more tender than I cook pork ribs for competition. But again, it just comes back to making sure that that collagen is fully broken down, guys. I've had undercooked beef ribs more times than I care to count. Or mention just not a great experience so right and just see the meats just barely clinging to the bone maybe it's considered overcooked by some
It's still got a little chew there. Really tender. I'm quite happy with those. Right? The meat is literally falling off the bone. This is my preference for beef ribs. Anything less still has a little bit of chew to it. Something that I'm just not that crazy about. So, Moving on from the back ribs. Let's get into short rib territory here. You can see my butcher paper is nicely stained by all the grease that's fat that's rendered out of these ribs during the cooking process. Especially on the bottom here. Unlike the back ribs, I did not put any liquid in this package. Um, maybe I skipped over that. When I, when I wrapped up the back ribs, I did put about a cup of beef broth in there. When I pull these ribs out of the foil, I made sure to save this juice. And if I'm serving these ribs, that juice, the drippings from the foil, that is always going to get poured over the ribs before I serve them. So we're going to set those aside for now. And like I said, move on to the short ribs. Nice grease stained rack of ribs here. Carefully pull this out. If you're somebody that likes charcoal at home with a charcoal chimney, this is the ultimate piece of paper to put in the bottom of that chimney. And it smells amazing while it's lighting up your charcoal. So I'm going to be tempted to throw that in a freezer bag and throw it in the freezer for the next time I cook with charcoal, which is probably going to be tomorrow. My daughter is losing her mind. There must be a... No? Okay. It's all good, guys. So, moving on to our short ribs. This started as a four bone rack. Uh, if you look at the quick clip I did when I wrapped these up, I pulled one of the bones out. What I had here was three bones sticking out one side and a fourth bone sticking out the other side. Just really awkward for wrapping. So I ripped that bone out. Okay. So flip that rack over. Some scraps here on the side. That'll be Casey. But this is it. We carve into these ribs. And how I look for tenderness on these beef ribs is you can probe it with a uh, thermometer. Again, I'm looking for zero resistance when that probe slides in there. But the other thing I'll do is just poke it with my finger. And if your finger leaves a hole, you know those ribs are tender. If that meat just bounces back and pushes your finger out, you know they need a little more time. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Get in there with a sharp knife, cut through that bark, cut through that membrane, and that leaves us with our cross-section of ribs. That's our money shot there, guys. So exciting. I'm just giddy, even though you can't tell it on my face. Okay, I'm gonna give it a quick squeeze, just to kind of give you some indication of how tender that meat is. Okay, that's our finished beef rib. Nice and tender. I'm not going to take a bite and embarrass myself right now because they're still really hot. We're still looking at about 185, 190 in these ribs. Yeah, we're going to let those rest a little bit longer. So finishing temperature on these guys, I, I didn't actually measure it so I could tell you. Uh, I go by feel and the finished temperature any other time I've done it is somewhere north of 205 degrees Fahrenheit. So it does take quite a bit to get it up there and get all that collagen rendered out. That concludes the formal presentation this evening. Now I'm looking forward to seeing some, hearing some questions, guys. What do you have for me? They're right there. Oh, you gloved. Okay. All right. I don't remember. Oh, wait, I need my pad so I can keep it. Question number one. How much do both cuts usually cost? That's a good question. Um, dollars per pound or per kilogram? Oh, I'm not sure I can answer that for you. Um, beef rib, beef, beef is all pretty expensive right now. Um, I haven't bought beef ribs in a regular grocery store in, in quite some time. Uh, I brought some in for my wholesaler today because we plan on uh, cooking them next Friday night for our Friday night takeout special. And they were about uh, $10 a kilogram. Fairly expensive per rack. But not nearly as expensive as these short ribs. So the, these short ribs that I've been buying, that four, four bone rack, depending on where I get them from, that price range is anywhere from 40 to $60 per rack. Where can you get them from? In Regina, Butcher Boy Meats on Park Street has these in stock all the time. Um, Wholesale Club, I've seen stock them from time to time. Um, they sell a four rack 
cryovac there uh, it's not triple a beef it, you know the quality is it's not quite up there but it's certainly available if you're looking for it uh call around it's a fairly easy cut to find at butcher shops if they don't carry it chances are they'll bring them in unfortunately they are quite an extravagant cook from a from a monetary standpoint i could cook um you know i could feed a family of four with this rack a uh, hungry family of four with this rack but that'd be a 75 dollar 60 to 75 dollar meal so uh, if your family is used to spending that kind of money to feed your family of four on a, on a single meal then by all means go for it uh, it does make it a pretty restrictive cut to sell commercially to give you some perspective um, one of the more well-known barbecue restaurants in canada is out in toronto and they will give you a three bone rack of beef ribs by pre-order for $100 Canadian. Uh, plus GST, of course, plus PST. Um, it's an expensive cut, unfortunately, but to splurge, it is something that's really, really delicious. Measure the salt and pepper by weight or volume. That's a good question. I've always done it by volume. Um, the reason I've done it by volume is that's how Wayne Mueller explained it to us when he taught that class on beef ribs. That means one cup of kosher salt, nine cups of coarse ground pepper. Do you ship to Ontario? <laughs> if so, where can it be bought? Um, let's assume we're talking about spice rubs here. Yes, we do ship to Ontario. Um, our products are carried out there at Barbecues Galore. They have two or three locations and at the Finch Market in Southern Ontario. We do ship across Canada through Canada Post. Um, we do all our bottling here in Regina, so we're happy to send you some product it's available on our website now if you're talking about the meat i have not done that it's not something we've explored nor plan to in the near future so when do you put it in foil uh start or part way through what temperature would you foil um this question probably got ans answered this question probably got asked before i answered it tonight but a good question of course um i wrap based on the color of the bark and that bark is really well developed really well set I don't know what the internal temperature is. The timeline can vary depending on what rub was used, depending on what kind of smoker we're using, that sort of thing. So, do you always cook short ribs as a rack? Good question. I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> the only alternate to that is what I would call, um, you know, Korean or Asian style short ribs, where they take the whole rack and run it through a bandsaw and cut those bones right through. You end up with We'll strip of meat with four thin little bones in there. It's a good cut for grilling. Uh, it ends up chewy. Um, for those of you that haven't seen us on Food Network Canada, it was our round two dish in Firemaster. So yeah, cooking short ribs differently happens all the time. If we're doing true southern barbecue, I do prefer a full rack. You can cook them by individual bones. I just love the moisture that gets retained when I cook the full rack and carve it open like that. Okay. When should I bother with a thermometer if it only has little value? Well, let me answer this with two with uh, two answers. Number one, if you're just starting into barbecue, that thermometer gives you a really good indication of how close your meat is getting, right? Big rack of beef ribs, like a brisket, will stall at some point. When it starts pulling through that stall anywhere from 165 to 170, and that internal temperature starts rising again, you know you have a smaller window of time before that meat is fully tender. Um, really, <laughs> that's about it. I cooked these ribs from start to finish today with, without the use of a thermometer at all, but I've also done it a hundred times. So the feel is a little more native to me. If you're not sure about feel, that thermometer is a good place to start. Would you hang these at all? Cook on rack the whole time. Uh, hanging ribs is something that I would, that I would do in the gateway drum smoker. Um, I think you could hang the ribs to start. Uh, once I wrap these ribs up in foil or butcher paper, that hanging becomes a little more challenging. And the other issue is that um, we're looking for collagen breakdown to the point where these are fall apart tender. So that might be a little risky hanging them in something like a drum smoker. You don't want to split that rack in half and have half of it hit the fire down below. So, Delaney, do you have another sheet of questions? One side, yeah. Okay. A uh, quick shout out to the products that we use and love here today. Uh, everything cooked on our Yoder YS640 Yoder YS pellet grill. Uh, we've cooked on and owned about six different brands of pellet grills in the last 15 years. And the Yoder is the one that will taste to our deathbed. So really happy with that. Mm. 
Secondly, for, for Toddle Farms pellets, uh, something I've been cooking on for the last couple months and I'm really quite happy with the product quality there too. Canadian manufactured hardwoods, hand-selected woods, produced in Canada with real Canadians, earning real Canadian wages, and it's a good quality pellet. Do ribs stall at all? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think that they do, especially if you're cooking with a low and slow approach. Cooking hot and fast, I don't really see that stall in a phenomenon in any of the cooked meats we're cooking. But yeah, if you're monitoring your temperature over a long cook, I, I fully expect that you would encounter that stall. So something to be aware of. Do you rest? How long? Like brisket, I want beef ribs to rest for minimum one hour after they come off the smoker. If they rest for three or four hours, that's even better. So that's my goal with resting beef ribs. I treat them like a brisket. That resting period enhances the tenderness and, and really increases the overall um, uh, palatability of the ribs. Sorry. Do you prefer offset or yoder for beef ribs? Um, you know, for flavor, I have to say that the beef ribs I've had in Texas are cooked with offset hardwood smoke. And I've yet been able to duplicate that flavor on any of my cookers at home. So uh, I guess that would be my preference. Would you do moose ribs? Uh, yes, and I have. Moose ribs are fantastic. Oh, wait, I meant that way, like the same way. Sorry. Would you do moose ribs this way? This way or this way? This way. Um, I think I would do moose ribs more similar to what we did with the back ribs. Moose ribs do not contain all of that collagen and fat marbling that beef ribs do. Um, if we're talking about flavor profiles, yeah, I think the salt and pepper or that steak rub, I think that complements moose meat uh, a little bit better than uh, something a little bit sweeter like our tumbleweed rub. Hope that answers the question. Would you do these on a Weber Smoky Mountain? Water pan full or no? Uh, yeah, absolutely on a Weber Smoky Mountain. Um, I would do the water pan full. And the reason is because these are cuts that are gonna be on there for a very long period of time. With water in the pan on a WSM, there's moisture in the cooking environment, which means it's gonna take longer for that bark to develop. And the reason that's beneficial is because I get to wrap later in the cooking process. In a really dry smoker, um, that bark dries out faster and I'll have to wrap it earlier. Uh, again, the drawback of wrapping it earlier is I risk losing some flavor because it spends so much time steaming in that uh, closed environment. So yeah, water pan on a, on a WSM, that would be my go-to. Do you look for a mahogany color before you wrap? Um, yeah, I look, for, I look for the dark cherry red color. Um, that color is commonly... <laughs> Referred to in barbecue circles as mahogany. Uh, actual mahogany wood is a little, a little more brown than that, but yeah, uh, I want that color to be there. I want it to be dark, uh, but I don't want it to be black. So that mahogany is, is kind of that uh, middle ground that takes us in between uh, ribs that are you know, pale and, and orange or red and ribs that are completely black. So absolutely. On the show, was it the countdown reel or for show? It was 100% reel. <laughs> 30 minutes. The funny part is that, uh, you know, when they shoot the gun and you're off to the races, we had to make that sprint about six times. <laughs> so they could catch us running from several different angles. It was quite exhausting, you know, great way to get us breathing heavy before the action really started. Um, but you know, the fifth or sixth take, they did actually say, this is it guys, this is your final take and go. And we knew it was, and we knew the timer started. So 100% real timer. All right, we do have a few more questions coming in. Love the questions, guys. I thought with a kind of a simple topic like this, we might not get as many questions in, but I do appreciate it. Any comp classes this year? Uh, competition class, we did have one planned for Calgary, but we never really announced it. Uh, with only two or three contests in Canada this year, I'm not sure we can um, get the pull we need from competition teams. Even in a good year, it's a hard sell for some people, so. Uh, won't be happening this year. Can you smoke on a propane grill? Um, yes, I've done it countless times, but when I was learning and before I figured out that for the true barbecue experience, you need to buy a dedicated smoker. It can be done. It's really difficult. Most of the smoke in a gas grill escapes the grill before it even touches your meat. So it's a little bit challenging, but it's worth a shot. Any success with the hot and fast beef ribs? Yeah, and I'm cooking beef ribs for me for at home. Most of the time it's hot and fast. Uh, it's important that you wrap them. 
in that hot and fast cooking environment, sometimes you go from, you know, no bark to burnt in the space of 30 minutes, 40 minutes. So you you kind of have to stay on top of it, make sure they don't get too far along. But yeah, hot and fast on beef ribs, absolutely. What pellets do you use? Uh, I use Furtado Farms oak pellets here today. Uh, had one bite, tasted pretty much how I expected them to taste. Sample now. Somebody asked. It wasn't <laughs> even me, actually. Okay. Um, one more question, though. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between bark and burnt? Well, that's a good question in this case when bark looks like burnt. Um, experience, I guess. Um, keep an eye on your meat. You know, you're not, you don't want to open the door of your smoker every 10 minutes during a cooking cycle, but, you know, keep an eye on it. Um, especially if you're new to cooking barbecue, you know, there's no reason you couldn't open that lid once an hour, take a mental image of what that meat looks like. And when, once you think it's a little closer to wrapping, uh, wrapping stage, uh, maybe open that lid every 10 or 15 minutes, but you'll be able to catch it before it actually gets burnt. Doing low and slow, 250 Fahrenheit, um, there's very little opportunity for the meat to actually get burnt. It's just not hot enough. Now cooking hot and fast on a drum directly over charcoal, it is a bit more of a risk, but that, that tends to be more of an advanced cook process anyway. Um, Delaney. That's it. What's that? That's it. That's it. Okay, that's <laughs> it. Good. I think we're done a little early here tonight. Um, what's that? 7.45. 7.45. Really cool. Listen, guys, a couple comments. Don't leave yet. Um, I do want to pick your brains on something. And again, if you're here at the beginning of the show, I'm looking at the calendar and realizing that our opportunities are closing rapidly for Wednesday Night Live. So we've got one or two more in the bag. Next week's going to be a great one because we have a special guest lined up. Probably the most influential social media cook in Canada. A great guy, he's a passionate cook, he's a blast to be around. I'm really looking forward to spending the hour with him. That announcement will come out on the weekend. Lastly, I have a question for you guys. Uh, those of you who have tuned into these programs every week, I have a serious question for you. We did this for fun, we did this to get some experience talking live on the internet. We did this to share our knowledge. My question to you is, would you be willing to pay for such a class? in the future and if so what would be a fair price and i appreciate every honest answer you can throw at me guys when we get this video posted on instagram feel free to add comments in there or, or send me a private message on instagram send me an email i'm really interested in hearing your thoughts uh, we've been doing this for free for quite some time and, and our meat bill for these presentations is pretty close to uh 12 or 1400 dollars now and uh, we don't mind doing that but um you know in the long term once this covid thing hit Dozens and dozens of people asked us to do classes live streamed online and I believe there is a market for that um, Now that we've done it quite a bit for free I'm curious to think whether you guys think there's some value in paying for it. So appreciate your honest feedback on that guys um, That wraps up for tonight. I will get this posted on our Instagram and hopefully YouTube Appreciate any follow-up questions that come along and we'll answer those questions when we see them. Thanks again guys. Have a great Wednesday. Have a great week